Good day. My name is Earl Hirsch. I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle. And um, I have been asked to talk to the diatribe watchers and readers all about what we have learned in the past month to six weeks about telemedicine. It has certainly been a uh, learning experience for us. And let's first, about, first of all talk about what telemedicine is. This is not a new topic. In fact, we have been doing some sort of telemedicine at the University of Washington for over 20 years. We actually did studies both in type 1 and type 2 diabetes with our original web-based electronic medical record that was developed at the University of Washington. It is still somewhat in existence today. It's called Mindscape. But what we were able to show was that we could communicate with patients and in those days just their glucose meters because that was most of the technology that we had to help patients who did not live near the Seattle area with their diabetes. Of course now telemedicine with the computers and with all of the additional technology both in the world of computers and in the world of diabetes has taken on an entire new concept. The definition of telemedicine is using both audio and video technology to do a medical visit. Now that is a bit different than telehealth where that is a more global description where maybe one is just using a telephone or audio to do the medical visit. But it's been quite good because we have been forced to move to this way to see our patients. And the other thing that has been good about it, and there are a lot of negatives about it, but the major positive about it is that physicians can now be reimbursed. And that has really been the main barrier up until now, is that physicians would want to do this, um, especially for patients who lived a long way away, but um, they weren't able to because they could not get reimbursed for their time. Now, none of us know knows what will happen as far as reimbursement is concerned after this COVID crisis, but hopefully we will still be able to do some of our visits using um, this technology. I've been asked to state what the pros and the cons are, and there, there's, there's a lot on both, just like any time something is new. And it's hard to know where to start. I will say that for younger patients in particular, this has been wonderful. Um, talking to some of our pediatric colleagues who take care of adolescents and young adults. They are able to interact with their patients in dorm rooms, um, in very private places where they are more apt to talk about very sensitive topics. And this is particularly true with our psychologists and social workers where the patients have a better opportunity to be in a true private place. That has been one of the many pros. We can do this, if we want to, 24-7. Um, it makes that much easier, too. As we are learning to do this, there are certainly certain issues that have been challenges for us. For me personally, I take care of quite a few elderly patients, people in their 70s and 80s, even a few in their 90s. And they are simply not able to do what is needed for using the computer technology to have an interaction with us. Now, that's not the end of the world. We can still have interactions on the telephone, but it's not, it's not the same. As somebody who takes care of many people with diabetes who use pumps and sensors, one of the nice things is that as long as the patient has been able to upload their data, we are able to do the same sort of medical interaction as we can do in the clinic, which has been great. 
The biggest negative, of course, is that we are not able to do physical exams. We are not able to do blood pressures. I can't do a really good foot exam, although I can look at the feet. I can look at pump sites, but maybe not quite as well. But we're getting used to it. And, and my own personal opinion is, is that this has a very important place, but I don't think that for most patients it should replace face-to-face -face visits. For our elderly patients who really struggle with not just the technology of the computer, but the big issue is getting us data. We have so many of these patients who are now using uh, continuous glucose monitoring. They really struggle to get us any data. And for patients who are still using finger stick technology, that data is even more difficult to get to us. And in fact, for certain insurances, especially Medicare, we have to document how much they are testing their blood sugar. We have to document they are using their CGM well so they can continue to get their supplies. And it's hard to document that if we don't see the data. We have workarounds for everything, and the workaround for the glucose monitoring, if they're still doing finger sticks, is we just have them write it down and get the information to us somehow, um, scan it, and if they can't do that, even just mail it to us so we can have a written record for the insurance companies. Um, we could go on and on about the pros and the cons. Um, but overall, I think that the pros outweigh the cons, and many of the things that we are having challenges with will get better as time goes on. I think from the patient point of view, the most important thing is for the patient to be prepared to log on, whether you are using Zoom or another type of uh, technology, hopefully have all of your data to the provider's office and have the data in front of you also so we can go over the information together. So for preparing for a telemedicine appointment, that is the main thing. I have already had two patients get quite bad low blood sugars during their uh, appointments with me. So please check your blood sugars beforehand. So hopefully you don't have a low glucose during the appointment. But I think it's just like any appointment, you want to be on time. And especially as we are getting used to all of this for the first time, don't be surprised if your provider is a few minutes late. Insurance coverage has been really one of the major positives about this, as I mentioned before. Very early with this public health crisis, Medicare or CMS has decided they would cover these visits. And at least where I live, the commercial um, payers are also covering this now. So that should not be a concern for you. One of the bigger concerns for a lot of people is lab. You want to get an A1C done, maybe you have hypertension and we have to check your electrolytes. From my personal point of view, and I think Kelly Close with Diatribe would agree with this, if I have a CGM tracing and I have a GMI, a glycemic management indicator, I don't really need an A1C. But the problem is, is that many payers need it, especially if you are upgrading to a new pump, a new CGM, and certain insurances, the big one being Medicare. As I tape this from my home office on April 18th, 2020, I still have not seen in writing that Medicare does not need to have those hemoglobin A1Cs for their pumps and CGMs. The good news for us is that in my personal clinic where I work here in Seattle, the building has very few people coming in and out of it, no sick people, and so patients can go in and get their lab very quickly, or if they don't live in the Seattle area, they can get their lab at a local lab and send it into us. Um, 
We probably do more lab than we need to, but at least yearly, yearly lipids, yearly kidney function and electrolytes, especially for patients who are taking statins, patients on ACE inhibitors or diuretics, I really need to see those a minimum of once a year. And since I have so many patients who take thyroid medicine, since I see so much type 1 diabetes, patients need to have their thyroid check at least once a year. And if I've started somebody on thyroid or I've had to change their dose, I really need to see that. So the bottom line is getting labs can be tricky. People don't want to leave their homes now. And um, the good news is, at least where I am, they don't need to come in contact with sick people if they get their labs. Can I prescribe medications as usual? The answer is yes, I do that electronically anyway, either to the local pharmacy or to the mail order. We have more people now wanting to use mail order for their insulin simply because they don't want to go to the pharmacy, which is fine. We generally don't have problems with um, keeping the insulin cold in the shipping anyway, so I generally recommend that in addition to the fact that it is cheaper than going to the pharmacy. In the last month since we've been using telemedicine, what have I seen that's been the most unexpected? For me, what I've seen is number one, how grateful the patients have been, how much they want to talk. In fact, I have to tell them I would love to catch up with them, but I think many patients are looking for something to do and for someone to talk to, especially some of my elderly patients, they are lonely and I am able to Zoom with them and um, they want to make it more of a social time and, and I have a patient or two patients waiting and so I can't do that. The other thing that you may hear, um, in my neighborhood where I live outside of Seattle, everybody is home and usually between 9.30 and 10 o'clock, the internet here gets very, very slow. And so what I've learned as a workaround, workaround for that problem, and it's worked quite well, is I actually have my own hotspot I use when I travel. And that particular hotspot with a local phone carrier doesn't have any issues. So I just stay on that all day long. And, and it works fine. Tips for healthcare professionals as they begin to integrate telemedicine into their clinical practice. I think the big thing for me is that I've had to learn how to type my note as I go because I like to dictate. And the reason for that is that when I'm in with a patient, I want to look at the patient as much as I can. I want to be involved with the patient. And using telemedicine. You can still dictate if you want to, but I want to, um, I need to get these notes done in a little bit more of a quick method. And so what I do is I type as I go and the patients actually see me looking at them, but I can't see them because I have the electronic medical record up in front of me. And when I need to see something, I just minimize that. Um, there are many, many other things, but I think that to me has been the big change. I know that um, Kelly at um, uh, Diatribe will be able to get in touch with me if anyone has any other questions. I very much want to thank Diatribe, and I also want to point out Diatribe's role in the PBS special that was on here in mid-April called Blood Sugar Rising. I just Googled it, and if you Google PBS Diabetes Documentary, it pops right up. You can just play it on your computer. It's almost two hours. I was riveted to it. I didn't get any work done that night because I found the story so compelling, and I was able to relate to them, and I strongly recommend that. And I thank Diatribe for their role in Blood Sugar Rising. For with that, I will sign out. Again, my name is Earl Hirsch, and I thank you all for your attention.